Good morning to those who are all gathered here in this lively sanctuary today and all those who are joining us online. We begin our service with a musical prelude by John Mayhood. Welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Charlottesville. What a lot of lively activity in here this morning on this beautiful day. My name is Angela Orbaugh. My pronouns are she and her. I'm pleased to be weaving worship this morning with Reverend Tim Timerson and accompanist John Mayhood. The sanctuary was built over 70 years ago on the homeland of the Monacan people. It was once cared for by enslaved people from Africa and their descendants. We honor all who have dwelt here and all in our congregation whose lives have led to this moment of our gathering. I invite us to take a moment to greet others. Those online, you may unmute and say hello. And those here in the sanctuary or in our social hall, please welcome and greet your neighbors, especially those you may not know. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Waking something for my for my granny's dog, which is Rascal. You know her name, Rascal. <laughs> So, let's Wow, Linda and Frank in a camper van. Nice. I like that. <laughs> We've been here a long time. We left in January. I can't do this properly. And how's where it going? Are you now? Good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and whereabouts are you? We're in Oklahoma, just over the Texas and Arkansas lines. Just outside of a state park, we're staying right now. Right, the state park doesn't have any. Uh, we couldn't, we couldn't oh. begin to zoom there, so we went up to a <laughs> empty restaurant Great. parking lot. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. We offer a special welcome to newcomers and invite you to join us for fellowship after the service in the social hall. Now, please feel free to use one of the red coffee mugs. Those are reserved for newcomers. And all of the rest of us, members and friends, are reminded to look for those mugs in people's hands and offer a warm welcome to the newcomers. We also invite newcomers to stop by the connections table near the monitor in the social hall to learn more about us. Now, seating is also available today in the social hall where we have a live stream of this service. Everyone is welcome here in the sanctuary, but if you need a roomier space to stretch out, the social hall is a nice option. 
Many thanks to all the folks that are helping share worship both here today and online, our greeters and our ushers, our hospitality and logistics team, and special thanks to our AV Tech superstar, Rachel Buckland, supporting the dual platform worship, both online and here on Rugby Road. And now we have greetings this morning from board member, Chris Little. Good morning, everyone. I just arrived in last night after a week in the Colorado Rockies. So I uh, have to say it was a week of real privilege, skiing and snowboarding uh, in a beautiful setting. And on the airplane home, I watched Isabel Wilkerson's movie Origin, which was a very sobering reminder that so many people don't have the privileges that others have and how important it is to look out for that in our world and to, to always be striving for greater equity and justice and opportunities for everybody. So I was really thankful to be coming back to UU to be in a community that is all about that and to be back with some balance in my life. So thank you all for being here and for being the marvelous community that we are bringing love in action to our community. Thank you, Chris. So here are our announcements today. It's a lot happening. The 2425 pledge drive is underway. So many thanks to everyone who has made a pledge, and I'm happy to announce that we are over halfway to our goal and have received slightly over $370,000 in pledges so far. So thank you. Thank you very, very much. <laughs> so emails were sent this week inviting all current pledgers to visit the church website and make a pledge online. Also, please stop by the pledge drive table in the social hall today after the service if you'd like to make your pledge today. Also today, immediately following the service, the Ministry for Earth team is hosting our second sustainable eating potluck. Everyone is invited to join, even if you did not bring a dish. We'll also have a green table set up so that you can learn everything you ever wanted to know about being sustainable. Now, after you get that plate of delicious food, you are invited to join us back here in the sanctuary for a special presentation called A History of Racism in Charlottesville, A Journey Towards Understanding. This is led by Freeman Allen and based on his book of the same title. Now, Freeman will share a compelling slideshow, and those who attend the service online, you're encouraged to just remain on the Zoom meeting. Copies of Freeman's book will also be available for sale today. So you can still go and enjoy the delicious food at the Sustainable Potluck, and you can bring that back in here for a lunch and learn. Impact will be holding its annual Nehemiah action. That's tomorrow uh, at the Martin Luther King Center for the Performing Arts at Charlottesville High School. They're hoping to have over a thousand local citizens in attendance. And we need a large UU Seville turnout. We want to show up. And one great, great reason, in addition to the um, purpose of Nehemiah Action, is that our choir is going to be singing. How great is that? <laughs> so let's all show up. It starts at 6.30, but we recommend that you get there by 6.00. There will be signs and you'll be able to find us. We'll all sit as a group. So you'll be able to find the signage to see what section that we are in. Democracy in action. I love it. Next Sunday, Reverend Tim will be hosting a new gathering called Afterwards. This is an informal conversation about the Sunday service and the sermon theme. So feel free to get your coffee, your popcorn, and in Join Tim in the parlor at 1230 next Sunday. So once again, 
after the service. Let's have coffee. Let's have conversation. Let's have some delicious potluck and join us back here in the sanctuary. Thank you, Angela. Good morning, everyone. Good to see you. Yeah, I'm on. So uh, excited about the Nehemiah action coming up. That's wonderful. I hope to see many of you there. And um, and I hope that, uh, was that Ann Salamini who shouted out democracy in action? And I hope you're going to bring, no, it's, I'm not calling you out. I hope you bring your raucous self to the Nehemiah action. That's awesome. Awesome, awesome, awesome. So, and a special thanks to Christine Gresser for coming up with that catchy title for my gathering next week afterwards. So uh, we were at our, at our uh, Thursday uh, Zoom session, and I said, I need to come up with a catchy title, and Christine was like all over it. And I thought, you know, if I announce it and offer her public gratitude, I won't have to pay as high of a royalty to her for uh, coming up with that title. So, all right. So our call to worship this morning, wonderful wor opening words from David Pohl. We come to this time and this place to rediscover the gift of free religious community. To renew our faith in the holiness, the goodness, and the beauty of life. To reaffirm the way of the open mind and the full heart. And to reclaim the vision of an earth made fair and just with all her people living as one. Come, Come let us, let us worship, worship together. together. As the Garrett Redmond family lights our flame of our chalice this morning, please join me in saying our unison chalice lighting words. All right. We gather this hour as people of faith with joys and sorrows, gifts and needs. We light this beacon of hope a sign of our quest for truth and meaning in celebration of the life we share together. And now you can join me in doing the hand motions as we put our hand out as the matchbook. Our finger is the match. We, we light, light this chalice, this chalice celebrate, celebrate Unitarian, Unitarian Universalism. Universalism. This is the this church, is the church of, the of open minds. Open mind. This is the church of the helping hands. This is the church of the loving hearts. Thank you, Garrett Redmond family. Now let's please all rise in body or spirit and join in singing hymn number 1023, Building Bridges. The lyrics will be on the screen and we are going to sing this as a round. So Georgina and Renee are our expert and, and Bob are our expert leads on this round. Together first, here we go. Building bridges between our divisions, I reach out, <clears throat> will you reach out to me with all of our voices and all of our visions? Friends, we could make such sweet harmony. That's great. Okay, now let's do, <clears throat> let's split up and we'll do in rounds. And we're going to start with this side. And, uh, and then this side will start and, and I'll get you all started. So here we go. <clears throat> Building bridges between our divisions. I reach out to you.
Thank you. It's beautiful. That, that was a very sweet harmony. Lovely. So Angela and I would now like to invite our children, uh, the young, the young at heart, to come forward and join us down here on the carpet for a little story. Come on down, don't be shy. Come on down. It's a good story, I promise. In fact, it's a story we're going to ask all of you to help us with. So, and this goes for the adults if you want to try it as well. So, here we go. Come on down. Okay. Now, I want to tell you a story this morning about, uh, this is a story from the Jewish tradition, and it's a story that takes place a long, long, long time ago. Now, once upon a time, there were two very famous and important rabbis. Does anybody know what a rabbi is? What's a rabbi? No. What? Like a group of people. A rabbi is one person. What's, what, what's special, what's, what's unique about a rabbi? Are they shepherds? Well, one way to think about it, I guess, but yeah. Anybody else know what a rabbi is? I'll, okay, how about anybody in the congregation? What, a rabbi is, means teacher, and a rabbi is a teacher and kind of like a minister in the Jewish tradition. So when um, people in a synagogue or a temple get together for their services, the rabbi will offer prayers and oftentimes will deliver a sermon, kind of like I do on Sunday mornings. Yes, Noah? Like rabbi. We, well, <laughs> not exactly, not exactly, but thank you. So, so. We do, that's true. We do offer prayers, that's right. So let me tell you this story. So one of the rabbi's names was Hillel, and the other rabbi's name was Shammai. There's a drawing of the two of them. Now, we don't really know what they looked like because they lived like over 2,000 years ago. If they lived at all, we're not even completely sure. But that's Shammai on the left and Hillel on the right. Now, both of these rabbis were very, very smart, and they seemed to know about everything. People from all over would come to them to ask all kinds of questions. And you know what? They always seem to have an answer. Once, one time, a man even asked Hillel if he could explain to him all about his religion, Judaism, and tell him all about the Bible, but do it while the rabbi was standing on one foot. <laughs> so let's try that. Angela, yes, would you guys like to? I'm going to demonstrate standing on one foot, and you can join me. You can all you guys want to get up and up stand on one foot. Join me try it? standing on one foot. I've been practicing this at only home if for you a can. While. You can jump on can one jump foot, on even me. better. When he stood on one foot, he said, Be kind and treat others the way they want to be treated. So let's everyone say, Be kind. <laughs> Yay! Nice. Oh, okay. Nice. Enough exercise. Very nice. Okay, you can sit back down. Well done. I can, I don't think I could preach a, a sermon while standing on one foot. That would be really... You could? Yeah, I'm sure you guys could. Absolutely. You might have... Oh, but you might have to swap feet. Yeah, I can I can see that. All right. Well, let me continue the story and actually tell you an even an, another little bit different story. One day, someone came to both rabbis with a really hard question about Jewish law, kind of like the rules of how you're supposed to live if you're Jewish. Both rabbis thought about it, but they gave that person very different answers. Soon, a lot of debates and even some arguments took place about which rabbi was right, Hillel or Shammai. The debates went on for days and weeks, months, maybe even years, but no one could decide who was right. Finally, finally, as the debating and arguing went on and on, God, a voice, decided to settle all the debates 
and all the arguments. Both Hillel and Shammai are telling the truth, even though they disagree. But Hillel's answer is correct. Hmm. <laughs> now, one of Shammai's followers didn't like that answer very much, didn't understand and actually asked God, why is Hillel correct if both rabbis are speaking the truth? Well, Hillel is correct because he not only listened to himself and to those who agree with him, he also listened to and learned from Shammai and his followers. And he even changed some of his ideas because of what he learned from them. So what do you guys think about that? You think, do you think it was right to say that Hillel was, was correct? Both of them had very similar answers and different ways to speak. Uh-huh. So they could have said Hillel was right, but they both had similar answers and different ways to speak. Yeah. Noah? They both had the same answer, but they both had different ways to speak. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Hillel So all people should know different different things about different things. That's right. So so yeah, so I think maybe several things I really like about this story. One is that two people who actually have different ideas, sometimes they both can be right, even if their ideas are different. But the I think the real lesson here that I think what the voice of God is trying to say is that the most important thing we can do when we have a when we have different ideas from someone else is to really listen to them, to learn from them, see if you can understand what they're trying to say. And maybe, you know, you, you may not decide, oh, I'm wrong. You, your ideas are still good, but maybe you can learn something from their ideas. I think that's what the story is trying to tell us, which I think is a really, really cool thing. And that's what we're gonna be talking about all through the service today. So. Well, listen, thank you guys very much for helping out and for standing on one foot. You were amazing. So uh, so let's now sing our children out to um, children's worship, which is in the parlor. So everybody goes to the parlor. Are an interconnected community that cares for one another. Part of how we embody this care is by taking time each week to share our joys and sorrows we hold in our hearts. As is our practice, you are invited to come forward now and place a glass stone in a communal bowl of water as a symbolic act of being held by the larger love that holds us all. Those online, you may type your joys and sorrows into the chat. Shirley Paul from our pastoral care team will also come forward today to help hold the space. Shirley will be available for a few minutes after the service in that back corner of the sanctuary if you are in need of pastoral support or just need someone to listen. Now, those of you worshiping online, you can contact the pastoral care team at pastoral at uucharlottesville.org. Let us begin our ritual of joys and sorrows.
Thank you, John. Our reading today is titled The Delight of Difference by Howard Thurman. So in 1935, the famed mystic and minister Howard Thurman led a delegation of African-American Christians to India. The purpose of the journey was to meet with the Christian community in India, as well as to experience India's many religious traditions, including and especially Hinduism. Thurman met a number of important leaders during his time in India, including Gandhi. In this account from Thurman's autobiography, he describes a meeting with the renowned religious scholar named Dr. K. M. Sen. One glorious morning, we sat on the floor in searching conversation about the life of the spirit, Hinduism, Buddhism, and Christianity. When lunchtime came, I had to keep an appointment. As I got up to leave, Dr. Sin looked at me and said, I see you are chuckling. I replied that he was doing the same. Perhaps we are reacting to the same thing. Suppose you tell me first, he remarked. I said that we had spent our whole morning sparring for position. You from behind Hindu breastwork and I from behind Christian embattlement. Now and then we step out from that protection, draw a bead on each other, and then retreat. You are right, Dr. Sen replied. When we come back together after lunch, let us be wiser than that. When Dr. Sen and I resumed our conversation, I had the most primary naked fusing of total religious experience with another human being of which I have ever been capable. It was as if we had stepped out of social, political, cultural frames of reference and allowed two human spirits to unite on a ground of reality that was unmarked by separateness or differences. This was a watershed experience in my life. We had become part of each other, even as we remained essentially individual. I was able to stand secure in my place and enter into his place without diminishing myself or threatening him. That closes the reading. <laughs> this community offers its love and support to what is closest to our hearts. Another way we show our care for one another is in sharing our financial gifts with our community and our congregation. Now our social action collection for the month of March is Cultivate Charlottesville, whose mission is to engage youth and community in building equitable, sustainable food systems through garden-based experiential learning, growing and sharing healthy food and amplifying community leaders while advocating for food. Their approach centers racial equity as we grow with students, neighbors, and others working to take Charlottesville from a foodie place to a food equity city where all residents can thrive. So Rachel, if you could show us that social action slide for giving for all of those who would like to make a donation right now. In addition to giving online, if you'd like to give today with cash or check, please use the social action collection envelopes here in the sanctuary. Place your offering in the collection plate, but remember not to seal the envelopes so that we can reuse them. Now, along with our social action collection each week, we invite everyone into the spiritual practice of generosity by giving to the ministry of our congregation. Through your pledges and with the weekly Sunday morning offering together our financial gifts and support sustain our congregation. This is our shared ministry. So during the music that follows, you may choose to make your Sunday morning offering by using the text address or going to our website. Here in the sanctuary, you may place cash or checks in the collection plates once again as they are passed. Let us now dedicate all of the many gifts we share with one another by saying, we accept your gifts with gratitude 
May we use them wisely for the highest good. morning again everyone. Angela, thank you for all of your help this morning. Let me just say, Angela, that when I gave you the words for that reading, and I ended by saying this closes our reading, I didn't have that part about the door in there. So that, I don't know how you pulled that off, but that was very impressive. Very, very impressive. So, uh, but Angela has so many amazing talents. So um, I want to spend most of my time this morning sharing a story with you. Um, this is a story from my own experience, and um, I think I hope it connects to kind of the themes that we're that I'm trying to pull that we're, Angela and I are trying to pull together this morning. Um, it's not maybe not quite as compelling as Howard Thurman and Dr. Sen, but then you know, as any minister will tell you. None of us can pull a story together like Howard Thurman can. So this story begins, gosh, about 20 years ago when I was a seminary student and in training to become a Unitarian Universalist minister. I spent one summer working as a student chaplain doing something called clinical pastoral education, which is required of all those who are training to for the ministry, and I did this training at a this uh, chaplaincy at a hospital in the Boston area where I was uh, living and attending seminary. Now, I although I was required to do you know some of the usual stuff that students do, I had to go to some lectures and I had to write uh, what felt like an endless stream of reflection papers. Most of my time was spent visiting patients. I listened as they shared their joys and sorrows, their hopes and their fears. Now, while the vast majority of my experiences with patients consisted of these kinds of conversations, there were a few that were, how shall I say, a bit more challenging. You see, as a chaplain, my job was to find a way to connect with patients and to try to hold a space of empathy and uh, compassion in which they could share their stories and express their feelings. That was the job. But during one very unusual and challenging visit, I found it pretty hard, at least for the first part of the visit, to build that trust or to hold that space. So let me tell you a little bit about that story. And I'm, you know, you notice I didn't tell you the name of the hospital. I'm not, I'm changing the name of the patient. 
and so on. So now this story involves a patient who I'm going to call Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker had recently been admitted. I don't think that's him calling, but you never know. Mr. Walker had recently been admitted to the hospital, and I'm sorry to say he'd been diagnosed with a very serious form of cancer. As I read his, glanced over his chart before going into the room, I imagined that I was going to meet someone who was sad, probably pretty scared, and who would be struggling to maybe accept and certainly understand the fact that his prognosis was not good and that he was more than likely, in fact, dying. Now, when I walked into Mr. Walker's room, I was surprised by his appearance. He didn't look weak, didn't look sick. He looked vigorous and strong and seemed to be in reasonably good health. He also didn't look to be distraught or sad. In fact, he seemed eager to engage me in conversation. Now, after introducing myself as the chaplain and asking how I was doing, Mr. Walker responded by kind of flipping things around and by quizzing me about my role as a chaplain and about my religion. After explaining that I wasn't really representing any one religion, but was there to listen and just to see how he was doing, Mr. Walker pressed me to share my religious affiliation and beliefs with him. Now, during my time working as a chaplain in a big hospital, I had found sometimes that being a Unitarian Universalist was a mixed blessing. You see, although I considered being you, I considered that being you, you enabled me to be open and receptive to people of all faiths or of no faith, my Unitarian Universalism did prove to be a challenge with patients who had a pretty, um, how do I say this, exclusive approach to religion. On at least two prior occasions, patients had actually told me to leave. After learning that my religion was not Christian, even though I tried to explain that Unitarian Universalism has deep roots in Christianity and considered the Jewish and Christian traditions to be important sources of truth and wisdom. Now, I don't want to give you the impression that being a chaplain was a battlefield of religious difference. It wasn't. I'm just talking about a few people. Um, this was not a common occurrence. Most of my visits were filled with um, just listening and talking and sharing and prayer sometimes. Most patients weren't interested so much in me, and that was good. Now, after telling Mr. Walker that I was a Unitarian Universalist, because all my usual strategies, oh, I'm an interfaith chaplain, not representing any one religion. No, no. What religion are you? Okay. I'm a Unitarian Universalist, and then I gave him my little speech about us not, us not being Christian, but looking to Christianity as an important source among many. He looked at me directly, directly in the eye and asked, Chaplain, do you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior? So I fumbled a bit for a few seconds, or maybe it was a few minutes. I don't know. It could have been. I told Mr. Walker that although I considered Jesus to be a wonderful teacher and that I tried to embody his ethical principles and values in my life, I in fact did not see Jesus as the Son of God. Now, I have to say that at, after giving Mr. Walker this answer, I was fully prepared for him to tell me to take a hike. After all, I had had two prior conversations that had ended with me being asked to leave once I had been outed as a UU. But much to my surprise, Mr. Walker was different. He wanted to talk. He wanted to teach. I think he wanted to save me. 
So rather than tossing me out of his room, he asked me another question very directly. And this one was even tougher. And this is a question I had not been asked before. How can you call yourself a chaplain if you don't believe that Jesus died for your sins and for mine? Now, this one really left me stumped, and I have to say a bit shaken. Like many Unitarian Universalists, I've been told plenty of times that because I didn't accept a certain belief or doctrine that my eternal soul was in jeopardy. I've heard that many times. That was nothing new. But I had never had someone challenge my legitimacy as a minister because of my beliefs or lack of beliefs. I wish I could tell you that I was thinking and responding with civility, with patience and understanding and compassion. But on the inside, I wasn't. I remember feeling more and more defensive and even angry. I remember thinking to myself, who are you to challenge my calling as a minister when your religion so often judges and excludes? I'm sorry to say that in this moment of tension and anxiety, I even found myself secretly hoping, I did not tell my chaplain supervisor this, secretly hoping that Mr. Walker would just say, yeah, take a hike. That would have made things easier. But again, he didn't. He wanted an answer to his question. And as I as I sat there for what seemed like hours, it was probably just a few seconds, I have to say I was close, this close, to giving him a piece of my mind. But of course, then I remembered why I was there. I was there to help him, not to defend myself or my ego. So this is as close as I can approximate to what I remember saying. I consider myself to be a chaplain, Mr. Walker, because my job is not to represent any one religion, but instead to simply listen and to offer support to people like you who are in the hospital. Now, Mr. Walker thought about this, looked at me for what felt like a really long time. At first, I couldn't tell. What, what he was going to say next. But then he looked at me and his look, I think, started to soften a little bit. And then he said, but chaplain, how can you help people if you yourself are confused and don't accept the truth about God and Jesus? Now, as I listened to Mr. Walker's question, I have to say that something, or maybe it was his tone of voice, I don't know, something in the room and certainly inside of me began to shift. Rather than feeling defensive or attacked, I began to sense that Mr. Walker was worried about me. He was concerned about me. He wasn't really judging or condemning me. He wanted to help me. He wanted to teach me. He wanted to show me the path he felt I needed to follow. So for the next 20, 30 minutes, I just listened as Mr. Walker shared his story and explained his faith to me. I must say that most of his ideas were ideas I, of course, had heard before and had never found to be right for me. But something else was going on that morning, something more important than differences over theology or doctrine. You see, as I listened to Mr. Walker, I came to appreciate what his religion meant to him, how it offered him comfort and hope in this incredibly difficult time and how he wanted to share the gift 
he had received with me. The longer I listened to him, the more I came to understand that I didn't have to agree with Mr. Walker in order to respect him and to be in relationship with him. Now, after Mr. Walker finished explaining the key elements of his faith and going over his own story, I thanked him for sharing them with me. I told him, in all honesty, that I wasn't in a place in my own spiritual life or journey where I could accept or agree with much of what he had said, but that I appreciated his willingness to share it with me. And I told Mr. Walker that although I couldn't accept his beliefs, I admired his commitment to his faith, and I could see how much it had enriched his life. And then something happened I'll never forget, and I would have never, ever expected in a million years, especially given the way Mr. Walker and I had started out. As I got up to leave, Mr. Walker put his hand out, shook mine, and said in a tone of voice that was kind and tender, you're okay, chaplain. Keep doing what you're doing. And I have to say that right there, that moment, that experience, that to me is what civility is all about. Civility isn't just about being polite. And it's certainly not about having good manners. Those things are good. That's, that's on the surface. Civility is not about sacrificing our ideas or opinions for the sake of avoiding conflict or not ruffling feathers. Civility is about listening. Civility is about learning from others. Civility is about honoring and respecting ourselves and our truths without diminishing the dignity and worth of another. Civility is about seeing difference as an invitation to learn and to grow rather than as a reason to fight or to hope one gets tossed out of a hospital room. And there's something else about civility that I learned from Mr. Walker. When we find a way to engage our differences with curiosity Rather than defensiveness, trust happens, common ground is created, and positive change can take place. Just as the story of Hillel and Shammai made clear, listening to and learning from others is the path to shared truth and wisdom. God affirms Hillel's arguments not because they were more clever, not because Hillel had a higher score on his SATs, but because Hillel affirmed the dignity and worth of the other side and learned from their ideas. And that, folks, I think is both a blessing and the challenge that we face as Unitarian Universalists. We affirm beauty, the beauty of pluralism and diversity. We recognize the importance of accepting one another and respecting the dignity of all people. But as I learned that morning in Mr. Walker's room, affirming principles and values is a whole lot easier than living them. That's why we must continually ask ourselves, what does it really mean to respect difference? What does it really mean to accept all people? What does it really mean to practice civility? Soon after our conversation, Mr. Walker was discharged from the hospital. I never had the chance to visit him again, to tell him what our conversation meant to me, or to thank him for enriching my life. And although I'm 
probably 99% certain that he has long since passed away. Let me simply close this morning by saying, thank you, Mr. Walker, for helping me to see what it means to listen and to learn, what it means to see the dignity and worth in every person, and what it means to live as a Unitarian Universalist committed to the values we hold dear, compassion and human dignity, pluralism and love. And thank you, Mr. Walker, for your incredible words of blessing and affirmation, words that I have always remembered, words that will always stay with me in my career as a minister and for the rest of my life. You're okay, chaplain. Keep doing what you're doing. Amen. Blessed be. So let's now rise in body or spirit. Join in singing hymn number 34, Though I May Speak With Bravest Fire. The lyrics will be on the screen. Please rise. Angela, would you please extinguish the chalice? I'll leave you this morning with words from Amy Zucker Morgenstern. In every person we meet, especially those who cause us discomfort, we find an opportunity to grow, to learn, and to go further along the path of transformation. Every single one is our teacher. May life bring you many such moments and help you become the person you want to be, and may you always welcome those moments with joy. Friends, be well. Take very good care of yourselves, of each other, and of the world. Please remember to join us for the potluck and then for the wonderful program in here um, at 1230. Go in peace. Blessed be.